Hello, good evening. Um, welcome to SOAS University, and thank you for, for being here for uh, this SOAS ICOP event. Just going to have to tell you a little bit about SOAS ICOP before we kick things off. Um, ICOP is a acronym for Influencing the Corridors of Power. We're a group of uh, students, staff and academic at SOAS. And what we do is a range of things in order to bridge the gap between academia, um, students and parliament. So, for example, we author briefings with experts on a variety of different topics, uh, as well as holding events like this one with a, with a view to inform and to have some kind of impact um, uh, on our uh, leaders. Um, so this is a topic that we have covered a few times before, but of course it's still relevant. And um, so we are going to revisit um, the topic of journalism and the censorship of journalists. Uh, we're going to just start things with a short video clip, just to contextualize things. Um, we are focusing, as you can see with the flyer, we, we got a picture of Julian Assange there, so we are focusing on the case of um, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. So uh, for the benefit of people who don't know much about that, um, here's a very quick video so, clip. So just how powerful is WikiLeaks? Well, WikiLeaks was founded by Assange around 2006 as a journalistic platform for whistleblowers to share evidence of illegal or corrupt activities. However, since there is relative danger to mass publishing classified information, WikiLeaks acts as a sort of intermediary for whistleblowers. They're able to leak it to the press without having anonymous whistleblowers accidentally identified. According to WikiLeaks, they've released more classified intelligence documents than the rest of the world press combined. The organization first received global attention in 2010. WikiLeaks published the video of a U.S. helicopter gunning down multiple journalists in Iraq entitled Collateral Murder. Later that year, they also released thousands of internal military logs concerning the Afghan war. The release painted the war as a failure and disclosed the huge number of unreported civilian deaths, higher terrorist activity, and the sponsorship of terrorism by Pakistan and Iran. Several months later, WikiLeaks released a similar cache of documents concerning the Iraq war. They detailed 15,000 unaccounted civilian deaths and the U.S. tolerating torture by Iraqi security forces. But perhaps the most damaging leak was that of U.S. diplomatic cables in late 2010. These were private communications between U.S. State Department officials and diplomats discussing world leaders and international conflict. Many outlined corruption and human rights abuses in U.S. friendly countries. The publication of these cables even contributed to the collapse of the Tunisian government when it was revealed that the president's family was corrupt and disproportionately wealthy. The response against WikiLeaks has been overwhelming. The U.S. government has said these leaks could threaten national security, and many countries have openly condemned the organization. The then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said they might already have on their hands the blood of some young soldier. One Canadian political advisor even called for the assassination of Julian Assange. Additionally, since its inception, the U.S. government and others have repeatedly attempted to shut down the site and arrest its founder. Amazon has since blocked WikiLeaks from using its servers, and a number of countries have censored their internet to prevent WikiLeaks access. Payment services like Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal have also blocked donations to WikiLeaks. But in recent years, there have been a number of imitators, including region-specific whistleblowing organizations, which have been met with their own takedown notices. WikiLeaks has sent governments scrambling, exposed corruption, and garnered a massive international effort to dismantle its operation. No matter how you look at it, there is no question that WikiLeaks and the online whistleblowers that have followed in its wake yield tremendous power in this new age of information. We're very happy to be joined um, today by three excellent panelists. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce each one of them. Uh, Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He was a foreign correspondent and bureau chief in the Middle East and the Balkans for 15 years for the New York Times. Prior to that, he worked as a freelance war correspondent in Central America for the Christian Science Monitor, NPR, and Dallas Morning News. His books include War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, which was published in 2002, 
and American Fascists, the Christian Right and the War on America, published in 2007. Um, also on the panel, we have Stella Assange. Uh, Stella is a lawyer and human rights defender. She has campaigned tirelessly for the release of her husband, Julian Assange. We're very happy to welcome her back to SOAS, where she once studied law and politics. Um, and Matt Kennard, he's an investigative journalist and co-founder of Declassified UK, which is a news outlet covering British national security issues. He worked as a staff writer for the Financial Times in the US and UK, and he's the author of two books, Irregular Army, published in 2012, which investigated the degradation of the US military during the War on Terror and The Racket, published in 2015, which investigated how the US rigs the global economy for the benefit of its elite. Uh, welcome to the panel. Um, Stella, I think I'm going to start with you. Um, we saw a, a video introduction into WikiLeaks um, and Julian. Can you bring us up to speed on where things are with his extradition case? Sure. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here because it's always like coming home. Um, well, we're at a critical juncture because whereas Julian's uh, extradition case has dragged on for now over four years, uh, we've just three weeks ago heard back from the high court, a single court, a single judge who behind closed doors um, dismissed Julian's application for permission to appeal in uh, a decision that was just three pages long. This was a dismissal of an application that was 152 pages long. Um, so you can imagine what that ruling looked like. Um, Julian is now at the final um, stage of his appeals in the sense that his, his uh, avenues have narrowed dramatically, and he just has one barrier to being ex extradited at this point. Um, because the High Court has uh, refused his application um, to have a full appeal hearing, uh, he can now apply to a separate panel of two judges at the High Court to say that the first judge got it wrong. Um, you know, this is a case in which Julian should never have been in prison in the first place. And if it, the justice system had actually um, done what it should, uh, it would have been dismissed and um, he would be a free man. So the first thing to understand is that this is a political case. It's politically driven, um, it's politically motivated, and it is in its, um, on its face political because Julian is being prosecuted for having published evidence of US military, US um, officials committing and covering up war crimes, committing torture, um, corrupting the judicial processes of European countries in Germany and France, sorry, in Germany and Spain, in Italy, I've raised these countries because of specific cases that I'm thinking of, but the evidence is um, of a system of impunity and of subversion of, subversion of international uh, legal um, obligations and protections that protect human rights and protect victims, and a system of um, that the US has imposed behind uh, the scenes uh, to get away with murder, quite literally. And that is really what is going on, that Julian um, opened the curtains to how this actually happens, and there is a revenge that is taking place through the uh, abuse of the legal process to hound him, to keep him in prison um, to make an example of him so that 
the rest of the press, and not just the press, but everyone else, gets the message that if you actually try to exercise your rights, if you actually try to expose um, the abuser, then you will be punished and you will be silenced and you will be imprisoned. So that's the real situation. The, uh, the legal situation is just a, 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 a dress up. Um, what's it called? A dressing stitch up. Stitch up. <laughs> um, pretending like there's some kind of um, fairness or process or whatever you want to call it. But the reality is uh, that we have evidence of grave criminality and the guilty party is the US government and that is the government that is keeping Julian in prison and that wants to keep him in prison for the rest of his life. Um, Chris, if I can just bring you in here. Uh, some people believe that Julian being extradited to the US may not be such a bad thing given that it might be an opportunity to reveal some of the injustices that have been intrinsic in his case. Um, what would a trial look like if he is extradited to the US? He would be extradited to the Eastern District Court of Virginia, which is where the quote unquote terrorism cases are held. And my good friend Samuel Arian, who was a great Palestinian activist, professor, was tried there. Uh, and you can look at the burlesque of a trial that Sammy underwent. He, they finally uh, extradited him. He lives in Turkey, um, but he was held in county jails. But the, the, the farce, uh, the legal farce that defines the entire process here, uh, the complete evisceration of any respect for the rule of law, international law or UK law, uh, will continue. Uh, in some ways it will be worse because after 9-11, a series of measures were adopted by the US legal system, including uh, special administrative measures known as SAMs. And I covered Fahad Hashmi. He was actually arrested in London, Fahad. Uh, right after 9-11, the, with, of course, the prompting of Israel, all of the major Palestinian organizations, the Holy Land Foundation and Palestinian activists like uh, Fayed and Sammy and others were swept up. And uh, none of them had committed acts of terrorism, none of them had committed illegal activity, but they used these new anti-terrorism laws and SAMs to crucify them. Uh, and, uh, and that's what will happen to Julian. So, what it means is that there are all sorts of draconian legal measures that the United States can impose so that even if in the beginning with severe isolation, but also uh, that they can prosecute uh, based on secret evidence that even Julian's lawyers are not, are not allowed to see. Um, so one of the things that all of us who have spent time over the years observing in the UK courts uh, is how the most basic elements of judicial protection are uh, eradicated in Julian's case, attorney-client privilege. I mean, the fact that the, through UC Global, the CIA spied on Julian's meetings with his lawyers, but not just that. The fact that the Espionage Act is a legitimate legal tool to prosecute someone who's not an American citizen. The fact that <clears throat> you have somebody who was granted political asylum and given even Ecuadorian citizenship. And uh, the, the reason that Julian was in the embassy is because the UK government would not give him safe passage to the airport. Uh, the fact that uh, he, through Len Lenin Moreno, who was the new president of Ecuador, 
uh, and he got quite a bit of money from, I believe, the IMF, but a huge loan for essentially doing the dirty work of the American government, revoked Julian's citizenship. Then Metropolitan Police entered the Ecuadorian embassy, that sovereign territory of Ecuador, to seize someone who had been granted political asylum. I mean, just endless. And... I mean, we have to be clear, as Stella said, that not only has Julian not committed a crime, or certainly not the crime, the crime that he's charged with, but in fact, and I speak as a former investigative reporter for the New York Times, he has carried out the most important journalistic activity of any journalist of our generation. And he has the reason that he is a target is because what what journalists such as myself did we did on a much much smaller scale we may have exposed malfeasance or lies or crimes he exposed thousands of crimes through these documents and 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 destroyed the kind of credibility of uh the U.S. military, the U.S. intelligence service, the State Department, and and these institutions uh, were were wounded. Certainly wounded in terms of public perception, uh, and they can't forgive him for that. So no, I don't think that the extradition, if it takes place, we're all praying that it won't, but it's probably going to happen. I, I don't think his either his legal situation or his personal situation in terms of incarceration will improve. In many ways, it will be worse. And from all anecdotally I know about Belmarsh, it's already really bad. Um, Chris, you also closely followed the case of Chelsea Manning, who was pardoned eventually. Do you think that could be a possible outcome if Julian Assange was to go through trial in the U.S.? No, because uh, I, I did attend Chelsea's trial with Cornell West, who, who is, I'm now working on his presidential campaign. Um, we both live in Princeton. We get up at 3 in the morning and drive down to Fort Meade listening to classic soul. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Cornell drove, fortunately. Um, but there, it, it was it was a military trial, uh, and um, the the there were there were many impositions, including which will happen to Julian, that Chelsea was not allowed to raise motivation. Why? I mean, it was Chelsea, for instance, who leaked the collateral murder video, and the two, there were two Reuters correspondents who were killed. And um, the U.S. government lied to Reuters repeatedly, not only about what happened, but even said they didn't have the video. Uh, or they couldn't find it. They, they, I think that's what they said. But either way, um, and uh, I think that, that, that Chelsea was pardoned for two reasons. One, because the sentence was so draconian, uh, and um, because um, when she leaked that material, she was so young. I think that the, what kind of sealed Julian's fate was the release of the files known as Vault 7, which exposed the CIA hacking tools <clears throat> into our telephones or even our TVs or cars, et cetera, and it doesn't matter. You think you've turned it off, but it's still on. And, uh, and that was uh, angering. I mean, this gets into a whole discussion of the CIA and how it operates and what it is. It's a state within a state. It's completely dark. We don't. It also doesn't really function as an intelligence service. We have 17 intelligence agencies in the United States. So the CIA has really transformed itself into a, a black paramilitary organization with its own death squads and drones and everything else. And we're 
I have a friend of mine who was a ranger in Afghanistan, and he said these uh, kind of dark squads, which they knew nothing about, would carry out night raids and stuff. And by the time he walked in with his unit, the village was aflame and everybody opened fire on them. Um, they're ca often extremely counterproductive. Uh, but that's when you heard the stories about the discussion to assassinate or kidnap Julian. And, and that's because that is the primary activity. I mean, after 9-11, it was open season. So all of the restraints that have been put on the CIA in the 70s under the Pike hearings and the church hearings were lifted, um, which included massive numbers of targeted assassinations. So I think beca because Julian under Vault 7 or WikiLeaks under Vault 7 in particular went after the CIA, um, the, 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 the campaign for vengeance was ratcheted up to a whole new level and was, and put Julian in a position that uh, is different from the position that Chelsea Manning was in. Okay, I just want to bring Matt in here. Um, Matt, we've got some uh, clippings of some articles that you, or uh, Declassified UK has um, uh, produced uh, I was wondering if, if you can see them, that is. If you could just talk us through some of the work that you've done and some of the documents that you have exposed. Yeah, I mean, um, just to carry on from what Chris has said, and Stella, I mean, the, the case against Julian is uh, political in every sense, and you see that reporting on the case. I mean, I've reported on it now since 2019, mostly with my colleague Mark Curtis, and it's astounding the stuff you find that just doesn't get covered in the, in the media. And I often say this, is that if anything we'd done at Declassified had appeared in The Guardian or The Times, this case might have been very different. So the media is complicit in Julian's torture and possible extradition. But I mean, I did one this week um, about Keir Starmer, for example, the Labour leader, um, who was head of the, the CPS from 2008 to 2013. Um, so this was the period when the cable gate releases happened. Um, and I asked for their, firstly I got hold of his documents of his, of his travels when he was at CPS and it showed he'd been to Washington four times. So I, I sent a Freedom of Information Act request to the CPS to say can I just get some itineraries or um, uh, briefing notes about those trips. Now that's quite routine, you can usually get those from the Foreign Office or, or other ministries of, of state. And they said they destroyed them all, didn't have to give an explanation. Um, this story went out and declassified. It did quite well on social media and stuff, but again, wasn't covered in a single mainstream newspaper. And sometimes I feel like I'm living in 1984, genuinely. Like, the, the stuff, that, for example, uh, what, what, what Chris mentioned, this is a journalist who revealed more crimes of the world's superpower than anyone in history. He's sitting in a maximum security prison in London the, the state that wants to bring him over to, to that country to put him in prison for the rest of his life is on record as spying on his privileged conversations with his lawyers. They're on record as plotting to assassinate him. I mean, any of those things, if you tell someone from a different time, oh yeah, this happened and, uh, and he was sent anyway, not only that, but the media didn't cover it at all. It's scary. It's a really scary thing because if they can do that to Assange, if civil society can drop the ball, if the media can drop the ball, they can do it with any of us. And um, the assassination article was really interesting. Sorry, I will come to my article, our articles. But um, the assassination article was really interesting because that came, I think, at the end of 2021. Now, 30 former US officials went on the record to say that um, the CIA had drawn up plans to assassinate Julian Assange. Now, that's amazing in itself because obviously in Washington he's not he's an unpopular figure so 30 US officials thought it was serious enough that they would go on the record Mike Pompeo subsequently said they should be prosecuted for that how was that covered in the British media the BBC the most important media organization in this country there's never been a single word written about that this is a journalist that was there was a plot to assassinate him in in London there's never been a single word about it the only place that any words ever been written about that plot is BBC Somali 
So if you read Somali and you cover, and you and you read the BBC, you might know about it. But that that kind of goes to show how crazy the times we're living in is. And um, with us, we started work in 2019 when we started declassified straight away, looking at this case because there was some op own goals. Oh, sorry, some open goals that we we found straight away. For example, the first uh, or the chief magistrate um, who 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 oversaw the case back then, she was called well, she's called Lady Arbuthnot. She's since been promoted to the High Court, but she was um, she made two key decisions against Julian in 2018. She, um, it, her, her husband um, it, is a former defense minister for the, for the Tories. She actually received uh, financial benefits from the Foreign Office before she made those rulings. So we did a, a stream of articles. I mean, there was tons of stuff. And it, in fact, that came out and declassified, and she eventually stood aside on the case. We never heard that was because of our articles, but the timing made sense. Subsequent to that, we did, we've done one about how Lord... Um, Chief Justice Ian Burnett, who was who's the High Court judge who overruled the lower court decision not to extradite Assange. He's a 40-year good friend of the Tory minister who arranged Assange's arrest. Again, never not a single word has ever appeared in the mainstream media about this stuff. And if they had, there might have been movement. Because actually, in the case of Lady Arbuthnot, um, there was a there was an article in The Guardian about another case, and she had to publicly make a statement. So you know the the, the media could easily ratchet up the pressure on these people, but they don't. Um, I mean, I could talk for days about this case just because it's so insane, uh, the, the, the legal system. And it's all happened, it's so brazen. It's, it's Jonathan Swift's recent um, ruling was three pages. He took 10 months to write three pages, which basically, and, and the argument of that, if you read it, was, no, their, their, their application was too long, I can't be bothered to read it. They want to relitigate the, 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 the decision. It's like, yes, that's what an appeal is. You, meant to re you can relitigate stuff you think the former judge has got wrong. So I don't think Julian's ever going to get a, a fair hearing in, in the UK. And that has major implications for everyone in Britain because a major sign of authoritarianism is when the, the, ju the judiciary becomes under the control of the state. And in the case of Julian, that's happened. If it can happen with him, it can happen with anyone. So it's a very worrying thing for, for anyone because, as, as Chris said, we know that there's elements in Washington that want to get him and we'll stop at nothing to get him. In a, in, a, in a functioning democracy with an independent judiciary, that would be the protection for someone in the UK jurisdiction against those forces. But they've become accomplices to those forces, so he's, he's got no chance. Um, I, I'll, I'll just finish by saying that I think that I, we've covered a lot of the legal case, but I think Julian exposed three major things with his, with his work. Firstly, it was the US empire and the war on terror, which was just an um, explosion of violence which terrorized countries and societies uh, all over the Middle East. Um, his work there will be remembered forever and actually changed the world. As that video mentioned, the Tunisian revolution happened on the back of those releases. Plenty of other um, uh, uh, good changes happened because of those releases. So. There's that element of it. The other element I think he exposed was the mainstream media because we saw when a journalist was really doing their job and actually taking power on in the way that we're told journalists do, the reaction of the mainstream media, they hated him and they went to war with him immediately after those releases. I remember actually it was quite interesting. I was working for the Financial Times in Washington in, in late 2010 when those releases happened. and the reaction of the office at the Financial Times was one of the major reasons I got disillusioned with the mainstream media, because for me it was amazing. It was like, okay, someone is actually doing what we're told we're meant to do. We're exposing wrongdoing by the most powerful country in the world, but the journalists there all hated him and would speak openly about what he'd done wrong and how this, it, you, sh you shouldn't do it like this, you shouldn't do it like that. One of those journalists actually was Stephanie Kirchgesser, who became, later became a, uh, a journalist with The Guardian and um, was one of the major um, well, well, she was an author of countless articles basically hammering Julian and creating the conditions for, to get him out of the embassy. But So he, he exposed the mainstream media, and that was, that's obvious. It, it happened in real time at the time, but it was also ha happened subsequently, as I'm saying, with, with the fact that none of them cover this case. None of them in a critical way. There's been some critical coverage in the US with that Yahoo News article about the assassination. There's been good stuff in El País in Spain some in Germany, zero in the UK. 
Um, and then the third, uh, the third thing is the judiciary. Um, and he's basically just shown that the British judiciary as an independent organ is non-existent. It doesn't exist. They call it the Assange exception now, that everything's out the wall. And if there can be an exception for Assange, as I keep saying, it, it can be for anyone. Rebecca Vinson is here, uh, who heads international advocacy at uh, Reporters Without Borders. She went to Belmarsh to just cover, uh, uh, to, to, meet, to see Julian as civil society should do with a political prisoner. She was barred entry. And I think Rebecca has said before that she finds it harder to access Assange and access the case than political prisoners in Turkey or somewhere like that. So it's, it's really scary. It goes, to the, it goes to the real basics of what kind of society we live in. And what is revealed is, not very, is, is quite ugly. Um, and Stella, just staying on the topic of the media coverage of WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange's case, um, initially, news outlets were all over WikiLeaks stories, and many benefited and sold papers and um, got exposure because of these stories. Um, and then we saw that there was a focus more, eventually there was a focus more on Julian Assange as a personality, um, as opposed to what he was exposing. So wh when did that change happen? Well, it was a pretty much immediate shift. So what you saw was that um, while the media partners um, knew that Julian still had explosive material that still had to be released, um, they uh, uh, were um, partners. And as soon as they had what they thought um, they wanted from him, then they turned around and um, attacked him. And that's really, you have, to, you have to put yourself in the moment because where the press was at back in 2010 when these stories broke, they were really struggling for a, um, a financial model to survive. Um, they hadn't really uh, adapted to the age of the internet. Um, and here you had Julian coming in with a completely new model of journalism that evolved journalism. Um, there's an article called the Wikileaksization of the American Press that basically argues that now every, every press outlet has adopted the innovations that Wikileaks brought in in 2010. Um, and so they, they didn't know what to do with this. And of course, Julian was a superstar. Um, he came from outside the old boys network. Um, he was um, very, uh, you know, he talked about how these revelations should lead to reform and how uh, the collateral murder video reveals that this is a war crime and explained why, why what we were seeing is a war crime. Um, and also became a media critic because uh, with the partners that WikiLeaks was publishing alongside uh, he would say, well, look at The Guardian, why look at the cable that The Guardian is basing this story on, and they have redacted 85% of it, and they're not saying um, this and that and the other uh, because they're afraid to be sued, but, you know, like, um, it's, it's, it's published on the website, so what are they afraid of? And they're self-censoring for, for financial reasons because they have, uh, you know, um, advertisers that that might be embarrassed or whatever. And so uh, uh, the publishers were exposed for their own hypocrisy, for their own poor journalism, or their editorial choices were all out there for any discerning reader to, um, to analyze. And this was basically Julian's idea of what he calls scientific journalism. I mean, I find it very ironic now that you have all this, like, uh, talk of misinformation, right? I mean, that's just cover for censorship. Um, there are all these new organizations that are subsidized uh, to find misinformation, and really, it's just a a, uh, a means to to uh, control the narrative. But WikiLeaks, if if this whole disinformation age really took truth seriously, then all these kind of disinformation organizations would hold 
WikiLeaks up as the, the example, right? Because Julian's model of journalism is what he calls scientific journalism, that it should be verifiable, uh, that, uh, okay, you can write an analysis of, of, um, of a uh, news item, um, but you have to show what you're basing it on. And so the cables, for example, are the perfect example of this. You have, uh, you write up an analysis of something that happened, then you, you reference your, the cables and whatever else you're, you're basing your news story on. Of course, this was a completely new model of journalism and one that journalists who understood themselves as gatekeepers hated. And uh, they didn't like the WikiLeaks uh, model at all because of course WikiLeaks was completely reader funded and readers were global and responding enthusiastically and that's why PayPal, um, MasterCard, Visa, Bank of America, um, and another one, uh, started the banking blockade in December 2010. So this is, now you see a lot about, um, um, this, is, this has become a standardized, standardized model of, of censorship to demonetize, to, to cut um, channels off of their uh, readership and their, their supporters. Uh, but the very first time this was done was in 2010 against WikiLeaks, just within two or three days of the US State Department cables being published. At that stage, you know, you had um, uh, the, the complaints that like PayPal allows donations to, to the Ku Klux Klan, but you can't donate to, to WikiLeaks, which has just been exposing uh, US war crimes, right? So it really kind of um, exposed the true power structure um, and the that the way the mainstream media also, uh, as you say, was complicit and depended on um, on the authorities for, um, well, perhaps for, for their sources. And here came WikiLeaks, which was able to protect very high quality sources um, and a um, large volume of information. And they had never been able to match that, not even not even a little bit. So um, uh, there was this concerted um, effort to turn on Julian was because Julian and WikiLeaks um, was a threat to their journalistic model, to their uh, perceived reputation, and uh, because WikiLeaks was bigger than all of them put together in terms of the journalistic impact, in terms of the, the importance, uh, the journalistic importance of these publications, in, ter in terms of Julian's uh, platform, because he now had global attention and his message was journalism can um, lead to reform, it can lead to justice, it can help victims, it can be used in court, um, in, in court, and it has been used in court in the European Court of Human Rights, even at the UK uh, Supreme Court in the Chagos case here, it has been used as evidence. And this is a completely new approach to journalism. And in a way, WikiLeaks is bigger than just journalism because of, because of the, um, because it's authentic official documents. So it's basically putting internal history onto the public record and putting it at the disposal of the public and um, victims of um, state-sponsored crime for the first time were able to use these documents in order to um, to seek justice. And for example, in the case of Khalid al-Masri, who was um, abducted and uh, tortured by the CIA, um, a, a German citizen, he was able to use WikiLeaks cables at the European Court of Human Rights um, when he sued um, Macedonia uh, for, for, the, for the rendition. This is a completely new new approach and basically bringing journalism to its maximum potential. Um, I think I've heard Matt say that the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial was covered in the media um, a lot more thoroughly than the um, case of Julian Assange. Um, Chris, as somebody watching all of this unfold, would you say that the media's treatment of Julian is a continuation of something that was already in existence, or is this something new? I think it 
illustrates the bifurcation between the non-commercial media, which has always been existent, and the commercial media. So traditionally, the alternative media has always shamed the commercial media into doing its job. So I work very closely with Robert Shear, who uh, now runs his own site, Shear Post. He was the editor of Ramparts Magazine. And he exposed COINTELPRO. Never made any money at Ramparts. In fact, very good book, very funny book about Ramparts called A Bomb in Every Issue. Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, said that in Ramparts there was a bomb in every issue. Um, Bob had all sorts of desperate ways to try and make the magazine profitable, including filching an uh, advertisement for Pan Am from the back of Time magazine, putting it on the back of Ramparts, taking it around to potential advertisers to show that he was respectable. Uh, and, uh, of course, Pan Am sued him to take it off. Um, the iconic photo of the small girl naked running down the road in Vietnam being burned by napalm, that was in Ramparts. Uh, all the Black Power Movement, Soul on Ice, was in Ramparts. So Julian, in, 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 of course, as everyone has said, in an even bigger way, exposed the, not just the bankruptcy, but the collaboration between legacy media and the ruling elite. And I come from the New York Times. I mean, I, I, I say the real motto of the New York Times is do not significantly alienate those on whom we depend for privilege and access. That's the real model. Um, and so, as Stella said, they turned on him immediately. But in, in fact, uh, they, and I think as you mentioned when you were at the Financial Times, they hated him from the moment that it was published. But if they didn't print that material, then they would be completely exposed for who they are. They were forced by the work that Julian and WikiLeaks did to do their job. And that is traditionally I.F. Stone, all of the great journalists. I remember when I was working at the New York Times, some intern came to me and said, well, who do you think the best journalists are in the country? And I said, well, I could tell you, but you would have never heard of them. Um, and he said, well, they don't work for us, the Times. I said, no, they definitely don't work for us, the Times. <laughs> and that's why I admire Julian so much, and as, as does Bob Shear. I write, there aren't many people in the States who write as much as I do about Julian and Assange, but I can tell you that Bob Shear feels I never write enough. Um, and he, he has... He and I both lost our jobs uh, over our opposition to the invasion of Iraq. I had been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times, spent seven years there, and this wasn't an uninformed decision. Um, but we, both Bob and I feel you know, very, very passionately about what's happening, not only because of the gross injustice that's being done to Julian as a person, and let's be clear, it's a slow motion execution. I mean, they are consciously destroying him physically and psychologically. And they, they, they know precisely what they're doing because they do it to people all around the globe in black sites. It's what they did, by the way, to Fahad Ashmi. They kept him 23 months in isolation. And when he walked into the court in Brooklyn, he was a, virtually a zombie. So um, that's why the press is so hostile. It's, 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 it's because as Stella said, that what, hap what WikiLeaks did and what it published um, exposed their own collaboration with the, the very centers of power that had committed these crimes. Uh, and, and just to close, uh, the quid pro quo of legacy media organizations like the New York Times is that they will do the dirty work for the state. So we had a journalist out of California, uh, Gary Webb, was it, where was he, San Diego? Or, do you remember, Joe? San, it wasn't the Chronicle, Sacramento, yeah. 
so I was in Central America at the time. I covered the Contra War. And uh, he exposed the sale of cocaine being flown to places like Oakland, flooding these poor communities. And the way they took him down, and I have a friend who was at the Times, or a colleague at the Times who was part of that process, is they didn't go out and re-report the story. They went to Langley and they got background briefings that uh, uh, from, from the CIA that poured uh, contempt on the reporting, but they didn't re-report it. And uh, it was so, and, and of course, it's always when you come from a smaller paper, and I worked for other papers before I worked for the New York Times, the weight of that, those media organizations are intense because they intimidate your own editors as they are meant to. And uh, of course, again, eventually Webb committed suicide. Um, so there's, uh, having worked at the Times for 15 years, if, as a reporter, you significantly alienate or anger those in positions of power, they will cut off access. And that hurts you. That in the, high, the administration or the, the editors at the paper see that as a, as a journalistic failing. Um, and so you're very careful about not uh, crossing too many red lines to anger people in power, and then just to close, I was a foreign correspondent, which is a little different because I was overseas for 20 years, and places like Sarajevo and Gaza. And not only was I at war with the narrative being spun by people in whatever administration, it doesn't matter, they all lie like they breathe, whether it's Republican or Democrat, but I was always at war with my own Washington Bureau because those people their idea of reporting is access. Their idea of reporting is having lunch with, uh, you know, Dick Cheney. Uh, I, I was based in Paris after 9-11, covering Al-Qaeda, and the French had given me part blanche in terms of intelligence because they desperately wanted to prevent the invasion of Iraq. They were the, the uh, French intelligence service had human assets inside of Al-Qaeda, the CIA at the time did not. And, um, and so I had amazing material and I covered, I covered, I remember going into the counterterrorism ministry, uh, I covered Richard Reed and the shoe bomber and, uh, and asked if they, and the British intelligence by the way was useless and gave me nothing, but the, I, the head of the counterinsurgency department said get him the Richard Reed file, and there I am looking at pictures of Reed walking out of Brexit, Brexit Moss, et cetera. So uh, uh, when I would go back to New York, of course, the rest of the investigative team was being fed by, the, by Bush, by the Bush White House, by Cheney. And they utterly dismissed uh, real in <laughs> intelligence that I had through race. They just dismissed them because they were French. Um, so, and that was a very shameful period because uh, they, as with Russiagate, the New York Times perpetuated what we now know was a lie. Um, but they're not, there's no price for it because, of course, what they were doing is uh, they were handmaidens for power. And, and, and if you, within those institutions, those, those reporters are not only promoted, but lionized and given prizes. And I know reporters who never left the newsroom. They just, I'm not joking, I mean, for 30 years, they just typed out what they were fed. And, and, uh, and if, you, if you challenge power, uh, you can do it a little bit, but if you, if, you, if you challenge power consistently, you become a management problem. Uh, and all of the really good reporters, the ones with any integrity, eventually get pushed out of these institutions. Sidney Shanberg, I don't know if you saw the film The Killing Fields, was a friend of mine and uh, he was brought back from Cambodia and it was when the developers were seizing every inch of Manhattan to throw out the working class and the middle class and he started writing it. And uh, 
it angered the publishers and the publishers' rich friends and the advertisers and the editor, executive editor of the time, Abe Rosenthal, began to refer to Sidney as my little commie in the newsroom. Uh, and then he was pushed out. Uh, and, and so uh, these institutions, the, the, these big, powerful institutions, despite all the publicity about, you know, fearlessness and truth and um, are part of, are, are integrated into the power elite and just for those people who fall for the myth of, of uh, the, the Washington Post and Watergate, remember that all of the crimes that were exposed uh, by the Nixon White House had been used for years against the anti-war movement, the black power movement, I mean, the FBI assassinated Fred Hampton and the Post didn't write a word. It was only when those tactics were used against part of the established power system that the Post would report it. That's why. Um, but there's nothing that Nixon's plumbers unit uh, did to the Democratic headquarters that hadn't been done in worse for years and years and years against dissidents. We know that from Cohen Tobro. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think we're going to open up to audience questions now. So if you have a question for any of the panelists, if you just raise your hand and somebody will bring a mic to you. And if you can, just um, make your questions quite brief so we can get as many in as possible. Two on the back. Sorry, hi, my name's Hoz. I just wanted to ask you, Chris and Matt, do you really think that there's actually journalists out there that are proper journalists? Are they really journalists? Or are they just, in fact, units of the establishment that are rolled out to do whatever the establishment wants to be done? Are you talking about journalists within I'm mainstream? I'm talking about The Guardian. I'm talking about New York Times. I'm talking about Washington Post. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about Matt, who has declassified. I'm not talking about you, because you two are going to get called tinfoil people, and but you're the ones that are telling the truth. However, all these other people that are charlatans, how do we go around them? How do we stop them so, from the narrative? Uh, you know, they're not charlatans. They're careerists. And they know what's good for their career, and they know what isn't. Uh, I mean, for instance, having covered the Middle East for seven years, and I'm talking about fellow reporters who cover the Middle East with me, they know that it is not good for your career to speak about what the Israeli apartheid state is doing to Palestinians. That's very bad for your career. So they keep their mouths shut. There's no, we were all in Gaza, I've been in refugee camps, refugee, because, and of course, now they've just bombed Janine. But, uh, and I covered 2002, that incursion in Janine. But uh, they, they will bomb camps and lie about surgical strikes against bomb-making facilities, and I'm literally looking at the bodies of the children. So um, there are good reporters within these institutions but they either muzzle themselves or if they, they clash with the institution eventually, as I did, you, you and Bob did. I mean, you, you, uh, you, you reach a moment in the road where you have a choice to either pay fealty to your career. In my case, I was speaking out about the, I was denouncing the calls to invade Iraq for all the reasons that are now obvious. And I was given, I was called in and given a formal written reprimand because I was, quote unquote, impugning the impartiality of the New York Times. At the same time, John Burns, who was based in London, was cheerleading the war in Iraq. So it wasn't that reporters at the New York Times were forbidden from speaking about Iraq. They were just forbidden from speaking about Iraq in a way that challenged the dominant narrative. Um, no, I, I, Stephen Kinzer is a great reporter. He worked at the Times. Um, there are good reporters, um, but they don't advance 
um, you know, I was talking to Noam. I like Bo Noam's book, Manufacturing Consent, but Noam doesn't actually understand how newsrooms work. He's not wrong in the conclusions that he makes. There's never rules written on the wall, but you learn. You're astute enough to learn what will advance your career and what doesn't. And, and it's hard to get a job in a paper like the Times or the Post or, and so, and these people uh, learn to play by those rules because they want to advance. I would just add that the tragedy is that, that you do get people who come in with integrity and the institution breaks them. So I know reporters who, you know, by the time they're in their early 50s, they are completely broken people. Those are, uh, an institution like the New York Times is a very um, stressful, anxiety-ridden. I mean, I knew a reporter who came in every day and the first thing he did was throw up in the bathroom. But, and, yeah, because you, 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 those, those you never know, you, you're constantly on edge because if you cross those lines too much um, and they don't tell you, especially at a place like the Times, you know, they, they, it, it uh, it, 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 nobody's screaming at you, they don't, but you know, they, they're kind of gently plunging the knife into your back. Um, you know, when they, when they go after you, as they did with me, they don't actually fire you. It's like the old Soviet Union. One day you're on the Politburo, and the next day you're in Kazakhstan. Um, that's what they did with my friend Ray Bonner, who exposed the Masote massacre. What they do is put you on night rewrite or something, which is right up there with obituaries. But they, and they know you're going to leave. I mean, and you know you're never going to get out. I mean, you're there forever. Um, they're, they're very, but it's careerism. It's careerism. And you can have reporters who have integrity and are good reporters, but ultimately they always face that choice. And unfortunately, the vast majority concede to serve the institution. And those reporters who advance within the hierarchy are advanced because they're selected, uh, because those who run the institution know that their primary loyalty is to the institution and to their own career and not either to good reporters or good reporting. And those are the people that run it. So in fact, if you look at the hierarchy of the New York Times, these are phenomenal mediocrities. How do you break the monopoly that they have? How, how do you break the monopoly you have? The monopoly that they have. Send your money to WikiLeaks. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think you can be a good journalist in the mainstream media in this country. Um, it's not that there aren't good journalists working within that mainstream media, it's just that structurally it's impossible. and. I think, uh, as Chris says, some people in a sort of implicit subconscious way are aware. So when they get to, in the, to their 50s, they might have some sort of crisis because somewhere they're aware that they're doing the bidding of powerful forces when they're telling themselves that they're doing the opposite. Uh, because we look, there is a free press, quote unquote, in this country in the sense that you're not going to go to the Gulag or unless you're Julian Assange. But generally, he's the first journalist or publisher that's been put in prison in this country. So how you enforce the, um, the uniformity of thought, the obedience to power within mainstream journalists is something that's really exercised me because it's quite amazing the obedience that there is in the mainstream media without any kind of stick in the background. It's not like Soviet Russia where you get put in prison. So it is, it, uh, I mean, I had a, I had a literal, uh, I, I was literally told when I was at the Financial Times, I remember because I went into the Financial Times with the same sort of politics and the same sort of idea about journalism as I have now. But um, I just acted as if I was at Declassified. I just kept on writing all the stories that I wanted to write and covering the things I wanted to cover. Um, and it got to the point after like three years where the editor of the paper took me into a meeting and he said, his words were, you're a good journalist, Matt, but you're not an FT journalist go and do your save the world stuff and come back maybe in a couple of years. And that's essentially how they view it, you know. So it, 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 for them, it's completely alien, the idea that you might use journalism as a, as a tool to, um, to better the world and inform people of what's happening. For them, it's a career and it's a status symbol. 
And I never had the problem. Uh, I never had to have a crisis of conscience because I never wanted to be a journalist if I couldn't do that. Um, and luckily, I've been able to. But that's that's rare. And the the other the other the other part of how the system works is there's no infrastructure for people to stay independent. If you people come out of um, university or journalism school, where do you go? People get mortgages. They have kids. They want to have a normal life. You can't. You can't live like when I left Columbia Journalism School in New York. I wanted to. I wanted to work for Democracy Now, and I did for three or four months. But I wasn't paid, and then I had to leave. And then I saw this job at the Financial Times, and I took it. I didn't want to go to the Financial Times, but essentially that's what happens. And then you enter the system, and then you slowly get all your sort of rough edges shorn off, and you become part of the uh, the, the the uniformity of thought. And it, I saw it also explicitly in the Financial Times. Um, uh, Chris mentioned Chomsky's work, Manufacturing Consent, which was obviously a formative influence on me and, and a, lo a lot of other people. But I remember when I, as I say, I kept on writing how I wanted to write. So when I mentioned the Egyptian president or dictator, Hosni Mubarak, I'd write US-backed Hosni Mubarak, as well as, so you're, you're allowed to write um, Iranian-backed Hezbollah, but you're not allowed to write US-backed if it's a dictator or US-backed Wahhabi dictatorship in, in Riyadh. So I kept on writing, and it was explicit, actually, at the Financial Times. They would take out if I put US back before uh, uh, Dictator. And that's, that's a very interesting and, and a rare opportunity. Also, mentioning Chomsky, I remember when I was towards the end of my time there, I, I wanted to interview him for the paper. And they, uh, they, I, I, I interviewed him for the paper, and then I sent them the copy, which was all about the, the socialist governments which were coming up in Latin America, Chavez and Morales and people. And they said, no, we can't publish this. So I eventually had to publish it on a one, one they had a little blog, um, which they published it on. But then a couple of weeks later, they f it, it was the first time Chomsky had ever been interviewed by the Financial Times. And it goes to this, like, no one's telling these journalists don't interview Chomsky. Uh, he's the most important intellectual in the world, has been for decades. But why does no one think to ask? And then they were eventually embarrassed by my story and got one of their sort of establishment journalists to go and to go and interview him, and that got in the paper. It, it was literally, it was like a couple of months later, they did their first paper interview with him. So it's a very insidious system, and, and it's so insidious that journalists can say to themselves, I can write what I like, but obviously they can't. And I think it was quite interesting starting Declassified with Mark Curtis in, in the sense that journalists don't know how to react to us. We're completely, we have a complete blackout in the mainstream media. No one, no one will cover us, but we do get approached by mainstream journalists who say, we love what you're doing. Like, can we come and work for you? You know. So there's a there's a hunger on the inside for a a structure where people can do proper journalism. It's just that the way that the mainstream media has gone, you can't do that anymore. And I'll finish with this: that in the case of Britain, I think there has been something really sinister that's happened in the last 20 years, <clears throat> particularly at the Guardian, because although the Guardian now is a is a just a, a, a state ally, state affiliated media. Obviously, the early WikiLeaks releases in 2010 were done with The Guardian. And I remember in the 2010 when those releases were happening with The Guardian and The New York Times. I'd read the same cables being covered in The Guardian and The New York Times, and I always thought, wow, we're lucky to have The Guardian because The New York Times would take a much more pro-US, pro-government position. That's now flipped, and now I much would prefer to read uh, The New York Times covering this stuff. No, I'm not saying it's perfect. Neither of them were perfect then, but there was a, there was a, a difference. Um, and I think that's happened uh, in a very literal way by state repression uh, and also clever state repression. <clears throat> so the first story we did at Declassified was we tried to work out what had happened to The Guardian in the aftermath of the Snowden leaks, because they also did the Snowden leaks in 2013. Obviously, that was a hugely brave story to do. They didn't do it in a, they didn't do all the sort of everything they should have done with that stuff, but they, they did do it. Now, we looked at the D-Notice Committee meetings, um, which is, D-Notice Committee is this committee which meets every six months at the Ministry of Defense, which is a collection of journalists and security state officials where they discuss basically what you, what you can and can't publish. When I say that to American journalists, they're sort of like, what, this, this actually exists? You're meant to do it behind closed doors, but it's very explicit in Britain. So, uh, but there, because of this, there's a lot of conspiracy theories around what happens at the D-Notice Committee. So one of their, sort of outward facing reforms was they, were, they started publishing their, uh, the minutes of their meetings online and it covered the Snowden period. So we used that to, to do a whole long investigation of, basically it's, it showed that the security state were really 
panicking about the Snowden leaks um, and initiated a, 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 an operation to close the Guardian down as a, as a critical outlet, and they succeeded. Now, that involved firstly sending out loads of advisories, that, uh, and then they weren't listened to by the Guardian. Now, they should legally be advisories. The denotice committee said, oh, no, um, they're, they're legally binding, but they're not. Um, the Guardian ignored that, and in the end, they ended up sending GCHQ officials, famously now, into the Guardian to smash up laptops, which, again, like... Uh, like so much of this stuff is not something you'd expect to see in a democracy. But anyway, after that, they then appointed the deputy editor of The Guardian, Paul Johnson, who had been in the basement with the GTHQ officials smashing up laptops to the D-Notice Committee. And he, he, he served on the D-Notice Committee for four years. And then the last D-Notice Committee meeting, the minutes said, this, I can't remember, he was some security official at the MOD, said that the words he said were, we thank Paul Johnson for his service on the D-Notice Committee. He has been instrumental in uh, 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 reconnecting with the Guardian, that's the look. So, that, so you have a really clear black and white, and it doesn't happen like that very often, where you can really delineate how uh, the security state brings organs in house. But um, that's why we have in Britain a much, much, much more neutered and uh, weak and state-affiliated media. Because just to finish with this, I, I, I think it's because the state realized after the war in Iraq that they needed to clamp down on the freedom that there was in the British media because the Daily Mirror under Piers Morgan, I don't know if anyone remembers back in 2003, but uh, I know that he's a controversial character and is hated by a lot of people, including me. But he, um, he as editor in the Daily Mirror, he, it was like a, a rare opening of what a, a mainstream uh, tabloid newspaper can do if it's doing proper um, journalism uh, ag against the war. Uh, an illegal war. Uh, there was he was he he did headlines with, like the 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 headlines made out of oil uh, logo oil company logos. He did Bush and Blair with blood all over their hands. Amazing stuff every day for months. He had John Pilger on the front page, um, stuff you would never see now. And I think that the the and obviously there was a major uh, class sorry uh, street movement as well against the war. And I think that the state really thought shit. This is not good. We've got to clamp down. And I think that there if you look. We, haven't, we looked into The Guardian, but I think if you looked across the board at how they have clamped down on the British media, you'd see that's why we have such a... Uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't even say we have a, a functioning media at all now in terms of the newspapers, and we did kind of 20 years ago. I just want to say that one of the unwritten rules of The New York Times is that Noam Chomsky's name never appeared in The New York Times. And the funny... I'll just, and also with no, the Noam Chomsky interview, the most ironic part of it all is he says that the Financial Times is his favourite newspaper. <laughs> so they have ignored him for, he was 84 at that point, they ignored him his whole life and then he comes and says he likes the Financial Times, his favourite columnist is Martin Wolf. And then, so it, I think that, that, that probably, that probably um, uh, freaked him out a bit and made them do the, the, the proper one two months later. Okay, okay um, we're going to take another couple questions. Um, hello. Yeah. Um, there are two questions I have. One, I, I read somewhere that I thought that the European Court of Human Rights was the last line of appeal, but you mentioned that it's going to be two judges who's the last line of appeal. Will Julian be able to go to the European Court of Human Rights? That's one question. Also, the other question is that um, there's, there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of news or news coming through the um the New York Times and who, who ran some of the WikiLeaks stuff, they're anxious about this trial of Julian Assange and, and about the First Amendment in America, freedom of speech and stuff like that. How how will all that how will that scenario affect his case in America if he ends up in America? I think Stella, do you want to take the European Court of Human Rights question first? Yeah, well, you're correct that Julian can, once having exhausted domestic remedies here in this country, then appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. However, um, if you've followed things, how things have developed over the last few years and successive conservative governments here have been hinting that they want out of the... Um, if not entirely the European Court of Human Rights system, at least the part that uh, in which the court can compel 
the UK not to deport, not to extradite. This is the so-called Rule 39, which is an emergency injunction when there is uh, a irreversible um, harm, uh, risk to life, torture, etc. So very serious uh, risk that is imminent that has to be stopped while the court resolves a case. Um, recently, there was this um, Rule 39 injunction by the European Court, which stopped the deportations of asylum seekers to Rwanda. And the Tory government is very up upset about uh, the European Court interfering with Parliament's um, decision to, or the Home Secretary's policy on deporting asylum seekers. Um, so What's happened in the last few months is that there's now a think tank in Oxford that has produced a opinion about how Rule 39 is not binding after all. It's total bullshit, but it shows what, what the um, Tory government thinking is. And uh, there is a real risk that the UK government uh, used Julian's case to depart from practice uh, that it has um, followed for the past uh, 60 years or whatever it's been of um, following Rule 39 injunctions. And when it comes to Julian's case, you have to be prepared for the unexpected, the exception, uh, the thing that people thought wouldn't happen, because that's what's happened again and again and again. And... Um, that's why I say that really what we know, what we can anticipate is that there is um, this, uh, technically it's a reopening of the case to this panel of two um, high court judges, uh, which have to be persuaded that the first judge got it wrong. And then if they agree with the first judge, then Julian... Um, then there's a real risk that Julian will be taken straight to the airport or that there will be an attempt to do that. So his, uh, his situation is really critical because there's no uh, legal um, predictability. There's no safeguard that appears to be robust. Um, and what we do know is that they're prepared to do things that, that they don't usually do. So, for example, in 2012, when Julian was in the embassy, he had not yet been granted um, formal political asylum. He, was, he went in on the 19th of June, 2012. And then the Ecuadorian government took about two months to decide, based on the evidence that was pre presented in his application about the risk of extradition to the United States and what was happening with Bradley Manning, sorry, Chelsea, well, Bradley Manning at the time, Chelsea Manning um, and the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Torture having by then already written a report saying that what was happening, what was being done to Chelsea Manning was um, cruel and inhuman degrading treatment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Ecuador, had this evidence before it, and then on the 16th of June, it was to announce its decision about whether to grant him uh, political asylum. And so they announced that they were going to do this, and then the Foreign Office sent a letter saying, we are going to invade the embassy. And what Ecuador then did, and Ecuador at the time was uh, under President Correa, I mean, this was, this was the government that had expelled the uh, U.S. military base from Mal Manta. And, and they said, Correa said at the time, sure, you can have a military base in Manta if we can have one in Miami. So that was, the, that was how the Correa government was. And instead of handing Julian over, they made that letter public, the FCO letter, saying that they were going to invade. And I can tell you that there were... Uh, UK um, officials, agents, whatever, in the building, ready to come in. So then the uh, Organization of American States issued uh, a joint statement condemning the 
the UK for um, uh, threatening the, the inviolability, inviolability of the mission, etc. And so it became impossible for the UK to go through with its threat. And Ecuador granted political asylum, and Julian was protected for seven years. But on that day um, that Julian's, um, that the announcement was going to be made, there were cameras everywhere. People had come outside, uh, outside the embassy to protect the, the embassy, you know, as human shields to, to bear witness to what was about to happen if they actually went into the embassy. And so there, are these, there was press there with big lenses. And I think it was, it was the Daily Mail who managed to get a, snap, a snapshot of, uh, with one of these big lenses of a, of a, um, a, a note, a notepad of one of the police officers. And it said, get Assange if in a diplomatic vehicle, whether he has diplomatic uh, protection, uh, diplomatic immunity, whatever, you just arrest him anyway. So they were prepared to violate the Vienna Convention and it's there in black and white. That, those were their orders. Violate the law and get him. So this is what we're dealing with. They don't, the, the, the law has been violated again and again and again. The only thing that is protecting Julian right now, and I, I'm not saying that he's uh, adequately or, or fully protected in any way, but, I, but the attention of the world on this case is the thing that can save him. I just had a, a private audience with the Pope on Friday. And this kind of thing is signaling um, politically uh, that there is, that, that the world is watching what is happening here. And that needs to be at every level. People on the streets need to show that they, that like they did outside the embassy, that this cannot be tolerated, that Julian cannot be taken to the United States. Because they'll do whatever they can get away with. And they, they do what they can get away with in secret, right? That's why they need their secrecy. Because they want to violate the law, because they want to, uh, they want to be impugned. We will talk a little bit about what people can do um, towards the end as well. Um, can I take a couple more questions? Um, there's, where are my microphones? Yeah, do you want? And then um, the lady in the yellow t shirt. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Stella, uh, thank you so much as a global citizen. I really appreciate the bravery that yourself, Julian, you know, you've shown, so kudos to you, and thank you for standing up for, for the voice of the people and for what's right. I come from Pakistan, and I can clearly see parallel, parallels with what's happening there, and I've been living here for the last about two decades, and you can just see, rather than, um, you know, the trajectory of progress happening in uh, developing countries, it's fascism which has made its way here as well in uh, the developed world. Clearly, um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm an, op uh, an optimist, so I look at this more as an opportunity because we are in a run up to the election year, both in the US and UK. Um, uh, you've spoken about call to action. I think clearly there is something with the, with the public, with people, uh, I believe in Vox Populi, Voice of the People, things need to be done. And I think if you can make people realize that it's not about Julian, it's about you. He's just being made an example of. And at the same time, you know, about journalism and everything I've been watching, observing, um, it's whole corporatization. I don't know whether anyone has done a PhD degree on this one, but corporatization is a new form of slavery, maybe? I don't know. But you've got to change that paradigm shift and you've got to monetize, uh, and I don't know how, but that mindset, and this is where people come into play. Just change that paradigm shift of, you know, maybe it's not monetizing, I don't know what, but somewhere where the shift has to go, that standing up to what's right will benefit you, 
your careers in the long run. And I'm not entirely sure, and, uh, but that is something that needs to be done. I mean, one thing I admire the evil minds of the world is they work in cahoots. One thing, if one can learn from the, uh, you know, the good people, I just divide the world into good and bad. So if you have to admire something from the bad and the evil minds, they work in cahoots. So please, let's learn something from them and just stand up for what the values are. And in this run up to the election year, let's see what we can do, you know, together as people and as citizens of this world. It's not about Julian, it's about us, each and every one of us. So thank you. Thanks, I don't know if there was a question there, but I don't know if you want to come back. Um. If the question is about call to action as to what we can do and how we can perhaps um, use, you know, this run up to election to, you know, make a cause for Julian. Well, in terms of organizing, um, there's a there's a little card. There should be a card on the table that has a link to the emergency toolkit, Free Assange emergency toolkit. Please go there, sign up. Um, and uh, we're going to be putting actions on that um, on that um, toolkit. Uh, we're calling for a, a big showing of support on the day of the hearing. Um, we're calling it Day X because Day X hasn't been announced yet. Uh, but everyone should be ready to to go and show. Basically, uh, we need bodies on the ground and not just on social media. Um, and uh, well, there there are many ways to support um, that that you can see on 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 the website. Obviously, people can donate if they're in a position to do so. Um, and uh, but mainly to stay engaged and go ongoingly to to the different um, actions that there are, not just once, and bring people and talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to your colleagues. Um, there are several books now that are very good. Um, one by Neil Smelter, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, that goes takes a deep dive dive into Julian's case. Um, and then another one by Stefania Marizzi, called WikiLeaks and Its Enemies, and uh, that's kind of that uses uh, official documents that the journalist has managed to obtain through Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, and she reconstructs the conspiracy to to jail Julian. Uh, so those are two kind of essential reading books if you want to take like a, a, a deep dive into this persecution. Um, but you don't have to know everything in detail. I mean, we've already the, the, the what's at stake in the big picture is is that there's a journalist that's in prison for publishing the truth and that um, the freedom of the press in our future um, to be able to be told the pr truth and to seek the truth um, and to publish it is at stake. And that is being decided with this case. This is the most important case of our generation. It's not just about the press, it's about our freedom to speak, our freedom to um, know the truth, uh, the right to the truth, and um, and the, the free circulation of information in the age of the internet because right now we're we're uh, going through um, a kind of um, there aren't many spaces left where we can where we can speak freely you know I mean it's almost just in person is the only thing that's that's not intermediated um, and the era of of the internet as a as a a place where information could be exchanged um, directly is is over for the most part, unless you're um, really into it. <laughs> um, there are still some some projects and so on, but um, and then of course, if we don't have the right to speak freely and we don't have the right to debate and to confront and to challenge, then we're not in a democracy and we don't have a chance to democracy, right? Because if, it's, if we're muzzle, muzzled at the point of speaking um, or we're silenced because we spoke, uh, then, then, uh, then the power 
imbalance in society is, has shifted forever. Okay, um, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. As you said uh, <coughs> a few minutes ago that this is political motivated case, we know very well that uh, um, quite a lot of political figures have said the things uh, about Assange and sided with him and uh, asked for his release. Notably, my president, Lula, in Brazil has done quite a few of that co news conference and uh, uh, asked the journalist, what is it that they're, do they're doing in this world? That they're not siding with Assange. They are not uh, protecting him. They are not uh, bringing the case up. And um, he's, he, he did this in Paris. He did this in, uh, uh, in London after his visit here. And um, in Brazil, there is a, a big movement now asking the president to um, offer asylum to Assange. And, um, but how effective? I know it's important, uh, this movement, but it's not worldwide, it's within Brazil. But how effective will it be? And how productive can it be? And how can we actually do this if he, he's sitting in prison and uh, you know, we saw the case uh, Ecuador. He could uh, well, uh, very well has, has be sent there. But uh, um, how effective is this movement, and w w w what can Lula do? Because he's so high profile now. He suffered a case himself for lawfare, and even his uh, lawyer Zanin now is at the uh, Supreme Tribunal, um, and and he they I suppose they can do something. Maybe you you met him, haven't you? Met Lula in Brazil. Can you tell us more about this? Can can did you ask him to to do some more? Because I suppose he could do. He I suppose he could do more. I didn't meet Lula in in Brazil. Um, uh, the WikiLeaks editor and ambassador uh, met him in Brazil. And I, I did meet him in Paris uh, prior to his becoming president again. Look, all these all these initiatives are extremely important because uh, what is needed is a constant pressure at every level, increasingly over time. Uh, it's not about a single initiative. Um, rendering a particular result. I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe it will work and Julian will end up having political asylum in Brazil. You know, who knows? We just don't know. And things are constantly shifting. I mean, I see, uh, for example, a big development has been the Australian Prime Minister saying that this has gone on for too long, that nothing is served by Julian spending another day in prison, that this should be brought to an end, etc. Right? This is a big, uh, a big shift, because until that point, for 12 years, the Australian government has, had been playing along, saying, oh, um, nothing to do with us, he's an Australian citizen, but this is just justice taking its course. And now you have a prime minister saying, no, there's a problem here, and, and we, don't, we don't like this, we don't want this, and we're going to speak to the US and, and tell them that we don't like this. Why did that come about? Well, it came about because there was a very strong grassroots movement in Australia. There were elections, and um, the candidates were getting harassed by their potential um, constituents saying, well, what is your position on Assange? And in fact, the shift of the power balance in the Australian government came about because there was a new group of, of independents who were called the Teals. Each of them having Julian as one of their campaign elements, and they hold the power balance in parliament. And of course, um, the way it works here and there and in the US is you have individual pol politicians and they have an opinion. And they many of them have the opinion that Julian is a political prisoner, that he's being persecuted, that the case is bad for free speech and freedom of the press. But they're gonna keep their mouth shut if they think it doesn't benefit them politically. So in Australia, the shift comes down to people got organized and 
they shifted the power balance in parliament and then it was safe for the prime minister to campaign and say, well, actually, I want Assange out. And now the latest polls showed, um, I was in Australia about five weeks ago, so uh, about two or three weeks before that, there was a poll that showed that about 80%, 78% of Australians wanted Julian to be freed. And then three weeks later, it was 89%. Virtually all Australians are informed and want Julian um, home and free. And uh, I think globally, this is the, Julian is a, is a hero globally. I mean, you go to most countries I go to and Julian is a reference point of, of bravery, of a journalist who stood up and published uh, courageously uh, about what, what the press didn't have the guts to publish about. Um, and um, so, I mean, that shift has to also happen in the UK and the US. Um, we have slightly overrun some, unfortunately we won't get any more questions, but I'd just like to invite the panel to offer some closing remarks or final thoughts. So can we start with you, Chris? Yeah, I think Stella kind of laid it out. It's probably not one action by one government or one, but it's cumulative, the weight of many actions. Um, I mean, as somebody who comes out of the media, my, and somebody who followed the hearings here, uh, I, I am deeply concerned that if Julian is extradited, there just won't be good coverage, uh, and worked with Ben Cohen to fund good court coverage with a great reporter, who's formerly with the Wall Street Journal, Joe Lurie, who's sitting right here, because I don't want to do it, um, but Joe's going to do it. I mean, I'll go in and out, but I mean, Joe's going to be there every day, and that's key, because um, as I saw, the, the mainstream media will cover the first day and the last day, but they don't actually know what's going on, the, the, and, uh, and the coverage has just been horrendous. So, um, it, part of it is getting accurate information out on a daily basis. Um, and then Estella said, using that information to mobilize the public. Um, that's key. I very, was very close friends with Michael Ratner, who was Julian's lawyer. We lost Michael a few years ago. But I remember Michael telling me, and he was a great civil rights attorney in many, many cases, including the Guantan the, those being held in Guantanamo. And I remember him telling me that in order for him to do his work in the courtroom, it was absolutely vital that there be people in the streets, that he couldn't achieve the legal victories that he did unless there was mass mobilization. Because essentially that mass mobilization created pressure on the legal system to do their job and not carry out judicial lynchings, which eviscerate or ignore the rule of law, which essentially define the uh, kind of Dickensian farce that characterizes uh, the, the uh, assault against Julian. So. Uh, it's, it's information, good information, um, but then that's got to be put in the hands of a public that's willing to stand up and defend their democracy, their open society, freedom of the press, the right for free speech. I think those are, from where I'm coming from, are the two most important elements. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's depressing the situation, but there's also hope in the sense that people have created 
conditions where this is a global issue and that wouldn't have happened if people hadn't acted in the way they have. Stella particularly has been uh, heroic and inspiring at making this issue a global issue. Uh, and obviously there's hundreds and thousands of activists around the world doing the same thing because what they would have liked is for him to be put in Belmarsh and silenced and no one talk about him ever again and then send him to the US and that's it, it's over. But they can't do that now. It's become a global scandal. Everyone knows that this is a publisher who revealed war crimes who's being sent effectively to his death by the, by the country that he exposed. So there is, and, and the other thing is how history will view this because we're in a situation now where <clears throat> there's a lot of powerful interests that want his reputation um, his work traduced and um, ignored and uh, denied. And and they have, they're putting huge amounts of resources. I mean, there was a time actually, so initially when he was, uh, when he was working and you'd tweet anything in support, there'd be hundreds of like CIA, CIA troll bot people. And then it stopped for a while and they've come back. I have noticed there's a lot using those those lines and it's because they're scared they they know that they're losing the, na the narrative and losing the conversation and when when history is written in future generations they, they, those those powerful forces won't be exerting all the pressure they're putting now and the truth will be that he will be seen and he is seen as a a global symbol for freedom democracy uh human rights he might be seen as the last free man we don't know who we don't know how it's going to end but but we need to, everyone needs to keep going because as that lady said, this isn't just about science, this is about our, all our futures, a future for our kids, our grandkids, because the things we hold dear, democracy, uh, freedom of speech, um, free press, they're very, very fragile. They're much more fragile than we realize and that's, that's been exposed by Assange. And if they get Assange, the levies will break. It's not like they're going to stop. That's not how power works. They don't take, take, t pick off one person and say, OK, we'll hold off. They'll use those tools to go after anyone who wants to expose them. And <clears throat> I'll just finish with this. We talked about The Guardian earlier. I think that deterrent of Assange is already working because one of the elements of the whole neutering of the media that I talked about earlier that is probably true is that journalists implicitly, subconsciously have absorbed the the example of Assange. If you're working in an environment in London where there's a journalist in prison for exposing war crimes, maybe not consciously, but somewhere that's going to be uh, going in that you you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't you shouldn't question power. You shouldn't question people uh, who are committing crimes secretly because you don't know what's going to happen. And the end point of that. When, and, and actually, the, the UK government is trying to introduce laws now which make it explicit that you can't publish. They want to formalise what they've done to Assange and make it a crime to reveal uh, 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 war crimes and, and other things. Um, and that, to me, when you have laws, when you have a psyche, a societal-wide psyche, that you cannot question power and you cannot reveal, and, and they tell you what is in your interest, that's fascism. And that's where we, we will end. Uh, that's where the end point of this all is. And we're, everything is moving towards that place now. It's just in, in certain places. We had Trump in the United States, but when you have the conditions that we're creating, uh, all it takes is some clever demagogue. Luckily, we haven't had them yet. We had Boris Johnson, but he's, he's an idiot. But it's someone a bit smarter than him and a bit more uh, uh, w willing to... to, to to, to play to play people that, that they will appear at some point. So I think that Starma, that, yeah, I don't like the guy. But I don't know if he's a fascist. He might be, but um, <laughs> sooner, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that the, this is not just about Sanj. It's about all of us. It's about democracy. It's about it's about the future that we want to leave to our kids um, and. You see that, I'll, I'll finish with this, with Daniel Ellsberg, who died recently, the, the Pentagon Papers leaker, heroic individual. Um, he was hated when he re revealed the, the, the Pentagon Papers by large sections of the American society. He was, he was the, called the most dangerous man in America. Um, he's now celebrated, well, he, when he died and, and, and in the lead up to it, that he's celebrated as the good leaker. That's what happens when the powerful interests take their foot off the gas in terms of the propaganda campaigns. So um, we need to, uh, we, there is a righteousness that everyone has that we're on the right side with this, but um, 
Um, these are hugely important issues that that I think that if we can, if if, if a science can be saved, then then we can all be saved. Um, I think uh, look, the main message is that the fight is on. It's not unwill unwinnable. On on the contrary, we should win this. Um, Julian can win this, and uh, everyone can see that uh, this is just a, a, a parade of cruelty and of injustice. So um, they'll try it on, uh, but that doesn't mean that they will su succeed. And uh, the, the way of um, lessening their chances of succeeding is actually saying what we think. And what, what can't happen is for Julian to be a taboo subject or uh, a case that everyone just resigns themselves and said, yeah, well, it's terrible what they're doing to him. No, right? That's, that's not how you get someone out of prison. Like it, his, his freedom depends on public opinion and of people who actually have an opinion about this case saying it out loud and not being apologetic about it. And now is the critical time. And if you're going to do something, you do it now. It's not something that can wait. He can't wait. Because if they, if, they, if they can get away with it, they will whisk him off when they think no one's looking. And that can't happen. Um, everyone I speak to knows that this case is uh, a righteous one. Uh, you know, like, the Pope doesn't just receive anyone. It was a private meeting, so I can't really talk about what the meeting, the contents of the meeting. Uh, but he uh, he made the decision to have his photographers there, his videographer there, and to release that to the press. That's a signal, and that's very significant because he has lots of meetings all the time. Um, so don't don't underestimate our allies. We have Amnesty, and we have Human Rights Watch, and we have RSF, and um, Reporters Without Borders, and the Committee to Protect Journalists. And yes, The Guardian has put out an editorial, and so has Le Monde, and the Spiegel, and New York Times, and Washington Post, etc. Everyone knows this case is wrong. So there should be no taboo to talk about it. Not anymore. And there are books that are written in case people want to do their deep dives. But what's clear here is that this is the most important case of our lives. For the ability to speak the truth, to be able to stand up for victims, to ex expose war crimes, and to be able to live in a, in a democratic society. Thank you, Stella. Um, and Stella mentioned the toolkit earlier on. We'll put the link up here, but anyone watching the video recording, you can find the link for the, the toolkit in the um, comments. I'm afraid we don't have any more time. We're just... It's just a guess. I, I don't know. Your best guess is going to be before August conference? It, it could be before, it could be after. Yeah. Okay. He, will you get a warning? <laughs> as soon as I know anything, we will we will let you know, because obviously we want people to organize. But I can't tell you anything because. Okay, um, massive thank you um, to Chris, Stella, and Matt for being here today, and um, please follow us at SOAS um, ICOP because we'll let you know when we're doing more events like this one. Um, we did also produce a, a briefing on Julian's case that was authored by Deepa, who's here today. And um, you can read that on the website. Uh, like I said, please follow us at SOAS ICOP so we can let you know about more events like this one. And thank you for coming out this evening.